when we go back to the new normal, there's not a single company in Ireland or anywhere else in the world that will not have an enormous remote work play as part of their contingency planning. It's just simply inconceivable. Hi there, you're very welcome to All In Business, your weekly business show here on Joe, backed by AIB. Now, as you can see, I'm flying solo here in the studio this week as we practice social distancing. The threat of the coronavirus has changed the way we live, work and do business. And it's work in particular we want to talk about this week and the future of it in these uncertain times. With most of us working from home at the moment, we're gonna be talking about what that means for employers, for employees, for stressed out parents, for those practicing social distancing and self-isolation and so much more. And here to discuss that with me, I'm joined by the man running support for the biggest commerce platform for SMEs in the world, Shopify. It's John Reardon. I'm also joined remotely, of course, by Tracy Kyo. She is the founder of Grow Remote, an organization working to increase the amount of full-time permanent remote roles around the country. Now, our trailblazer is a man who, by his own admission, has tried and failed to start a successful business four times so far, but the fifth time is the charm for Devin Hughes, the founder of Buy Me. Now, before all that, don't forget to hit subscribe so that you get the full show on podcast or on YouTube each week. And of course, you'll find us on social media. We're on LinkedIn and Twitter with the hashtag All In Business. Joe presents All In, together with AIB, backing Irish business. John and Tracy, thank you so much for joining us remotely, as it happens, um, with the times that we live in. And given the times that we live in, I think more of the country is now working from home than ever before. But a lot of people still won't know a lot about it other than what they're currently doing themselves. And they won't know a lot of the terminology. So to get the conversation going, maybe we could start with a breakdown of what the non-traditional options for work are. If you're not working in an office that you commute to every day, what are the different options out there? Tracy, why don't you start with that? Okay, so remote uh, remote work is a uh, viable option for anybody. So it's a it's a career for for anybody across a range of sectors. At Grow Remote, what we do is educate people around how you find that work, the language of of the world of remote work, and then what those jobs look like when you get in there. So you have companies like GitLab, Doist, Buffer. Scraping Hub would be a great Irish example of a fully distributed company. Everybody from their HR team to their marketing to their tech tech team are all fully remote. Um, so you can do that job from a co-working space, from home, from wherever suits you. The most important part from our perspective is that you can pick up that job, that employment opportunity from wherever you are in the country um, and then perform it wherever suits you best and whatever wherever you get your best productivity from. And what we're seeing at the moment, would you call that remote work in the in the strictest sense, or is it? I suppose if it's a, if it's something that's enforced upon us due to the circumstances at the moment, can it really be? You know, it's, it's there wasn't much choice involved, I suppose. But what would you consider it to be? A pandemic, a crisis management in a pandemic that nobody has experience of before. So what we're seeing is companies who are saying, I, I think the best line I heard was, you know, you can't work in the office is not a remote work policy. That's you can't work in the office. Sure. Um, and, and people are forced home. Um, and their family are at home and their kids are at home and they don't have a home office set up. I saw Patrick Walsh from, from uh, Dogpatch arrive to his employees' homes with a truck and delivered their office to them. That's the real practical stuff that will help people do their job from home. Mm -hmm. But currently, this is not remote work. This is absolutely crisis management. What we want to do is bring it from, you know, reacting to a pandemic onto a sustainable form of employment for these companies. Well, that's exactly it, I suppose, Tracy. You're working to 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 ensure that people can work remotely, full time, permanently, um, and yeah. for the long haul. Um, and John, that's something you know quite a lot about. I know you have um, six hundred thousand merchants in one hundred and seventy five different countries. Uh, pretty much everybody working remotely, following the sun, as you say. It's actually uh, it's over a million merchants in one hundred and seventy five oh. countries, and the operation that we have here in Ireland, um, we've. Uh, Every single employee in Ireland works from home. So we are a 100% pure play remote operation in Ireland. And we've, uh, we started in, in 
in Galway about five years ago. We spread right across the country and a uh, very large group of people. But like uh, Tracy had mentioned earlier on, these, this, this was a group of people who started by, uh, by choice to work remote. And that's a huge difference right now, the difference between um, companies that have made this a conscious an intentful, um, intentional effort and those people who are in a situation where they have to do it. And that's one of the challenges that we have at the moment is to provide shared learning for companies and individuals for whom this is just crazy and that they're trying to get their head around, around doing this. And it's not as if this is going to last a week. This mm-hmm. is going to last a couple of weeks, a couple of months even. And it's going to have a seismic shift on on the rollout of remote work, you know, those of us who are kind of inside the remote work industry would, you know, amongst ourselves, amongst the conversation that we're having is that what we've actually seen is a foreshortening of timelines, stuff that we would have expected to see happen in the next five years is happening in five minutes. Mm. And we have foreshortened that gap of acceptance of remote work. I don't, you know, what's going to happen when we, when we go back to the new normal there's not a single company in Ireland or anywhere else in the world that will not have an enormous remote work play as part of their contingency planning. Mm. It'll never happen again that companies will not have a remote work um, part of their playbook. It's just simply inconceivable. Mm. And even, I suppose, in terms of the argument or the case that one can make maybe with a uh, stubborn employer to be allowed to work from home. And I know that that's something you talk about a lot, John. Um, You'd wonder how anyone could even refuse the option of working from home now. It's not like they could say, you know, post pandemic um, that it doesn't work because then any employee who's doing it right now can can look back to the times of Corona and say, well, it did work, it does work. Yeah, I, th- I think the times have changed completely. Mm-hmm. And like I said, you know, the, the timeline has so has foreshortened so much, but there's a mindset change as well. and. You, you, just take, for example, in, in Ireland, there are almost 100,000 people who, are, who up to now have been commuting daily from Meath, Kildare and Wicklow alone. Mm. It's 100,000 people, the majority of whom are going to a desk in Dublin, into the city, and they're sitting on a computer and using a phone. Mm. That's 100,000 people who are now effectively doing that job from home. And when I say effectively, that may, I mean they are doing it very effectively from home. There's a percentage of those people who are going to choose not to go back. There's a percentage of the companies who are going to say, you know what, I was able to manage a workforce and able to get productivity without incurring an enormous amount of commute time and without uh, um, belaboring or encumbering those people with, mm. with uh, a time loss that they're not interested in. So I think what we're going to see in the return to the new normal is a real shift in how uh, people talk to their, uh, how how labor talks to management in terms of what they want and how the management group looks at the labor pool and says, there's a better way to do this. Mm. Yeah. And uh, there are probably a lot of companies as well who maybe won't enforce anything or won't, you know, won't have a strict policy, but will... uh, Keep it flexible, I suppose. I know myself when I'm when I'm not in this chair, I'm working with Web Summit, and um, we've always had the option to work from home for you know a day here or a week here if you have a specific project that you want to work on. We've never had to do it long term before. Now we actually, um, I don't want to say jump the gun, but we were I think we were right in line with Google in terms of taking the step to do it now um, during the pandemic. So we're in. I think I'm in week four at the moment working from home. I've lost track. I think it's week four. But um, as someone who's quite the fan and the, the proponent for working from home, I was surprised to find myself that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting itchy feet now. You know, I, if going back to the office was an option, um, I would go. And that surprises me. What advice would you have for people who maybe are finding it hard to keep their focus at home? And be it distractions, be it the mental health aspect, you know, that they don't have as much... Um, socializing in their lives anymore or they're, they're just not getting the same uh, positive feedback from digital socializing as they are from an actual coffee break in the office. Um, is, is this, you know, is it a mindset thing, as you mentioned? Is it a transitionary period? Um, I'm asking for myself as much as for anything else, I suppose. 
I, I think it's it's primarily a mindset issue. You know, the what typically tends to happen is week one, people are trying to get used to just new surroundings, and it's uh, you know your classic new employee. You know, where's the bathroom? Where's the photocopier and all that in, in an office environment? You're now in a home environment, and you're trying to work out okay, what's what? Where are the basics? Week two is how am I showing up um, in, at work, and how am I? Uh, communicating with my lead and how is my lead communicating with me and how are we interacting? It's kind of week three, which would be for a lot of people would be coming up now. They're, the the challenge is, okay, uh, I'm now isolated. Um, what am I doing? And this, this, you know, all of us who work in the remote world will tell you that one of the challenges is self-doubt. And it's, mm-hmm. a, it's almost like the, an imposter syndrome or self-doubt. Like, am I doing the right thing? Is this right for me? You know, and that's even for those people who have chosen to work remote. So in this forced remote, large, unfortunate experiment, it's going to be a significant challenge for people. It's not for everybody. And let's be super clear about that. Remote work or working from home is not for everybody. But there are plenty of people. There's a good chunk of the people who are now in this forced remote um, experience who are going to actually revel in it and are going to choose that this is the way they want to go forward. Tracy, do you have anything to add on that? On the isolation piece, I guess, um, there is, uh, in Grow Remote, um, we've got local leaders who sign up to a platform called ChangeX. And then what they do is facilitate communities of remote workers locally. So to give you an example, <clears throat> Yvonne, like this isn't a normal piece, but and our meetups have now stopped, obviously our physical meetups. Mm-hmm. But there was a guy who turned up from GitLab, Mike, at, a, at our meetup in Castlebar, and he had 200 cards with them. And he said that when he first started working for GitLab, they gave him these cards and he's had nobody to give them to oh. for three years because all of the meetups are for self-employed people and sole traders and all of those things are not for remote workers. Mm-hmm. And he was so happy to be able to talk to other remote workers within his local community. Mm -hmm. So I think in the normal course of living, uh, those local meetups aid an awful lot. Mm -hmm. Um, And this isn't the, like, isolation is the biggest killer of remote work normally. Mm -hmm. And this is isolation on top of isolation. uh, So it's really difficult. Well, I know just an expression that that you like to say, Tracy, um, We've what what do you we've recreated the meeting room, but we haven't recreated the water cooler. I think is how you put it, and uh, it struck me as being quite important because I mean, obviously, if we're if we've seen phase one of the rollout of remote work, what does phase two look like, and how do we replicate the meeting room, or sorry, the water cooler rather? Yeah, Mm -hmm. so um, we we looked at the experts. So I think what we're doing now is like really fast and. Grow Remote, like I suppose we didn't mean to set up a company and we ended up running a a distributed teams ourselves, myself and Rose, and we had to learn these lessons where I was just writing about it. We set up Slack because we thought that's the tech, that's everything. Mm -hmm. And then we realized, actually, we need to have areas for people to congregate in that. We need to curate the experience. We need to we need to build it out a little bit better. Um, And so there's a company called Nearform. They're an Irish company based in Tremor. They're remote first. They've been doing remote for years and they're putting out lots of content and really, really practical supports in terms of how to recreate a water cooler. So it's very simple. You say at two o'clock, we're going to hop on a Zoom call and we're going to do a trivia, Mm. something, quiz. I don't know, whatever it is. And And you get to know people and you just don't talk about work and you allocate time in your calendar for those social interactions. Um, the thing with remote, and, and I know he said to say, you know, people might come after this pandemic and say, well, remote worked, you know, during it. So why aren't we doing it afterwards? It could absolutely also be a car crash for both companies and employees because it might go. We are hearing stories of managers calling up people three times a day saying, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? That's not how remote companies work at all. And John speaks a lot to trust and communication and, and all of those pieces. So, um, yeah, it, 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 it's not necessarily going to work for everybody and remote accentuates any problem you have. Mm. So in terms of how you solve for that, how you recreate the, those water cooler moments, you think through the interactions that you want your teams to have, the kind of culture you'd like to action, take action on. And then you m- make deliberate uh, workflows around that, for, for lack of a better word. And you ask the people who have gone before you, scraping up near former Nata Coleman, John Reardon, and that's what Grow Remote will provide you introductions into these people who have done it already and know all of the lessons um, around the nuances that, that companies are about to experience. A major perceived issue would be um, working from home 
in very rural areas where broadband might be an issue. Now, we've all seen the the ads on our television at the moment about, you know, what's going on on, on Aaron Moore. And I know you might want to talk about that, Tracy, and explain a little more to us about that. But uh, I guess my question would be, are we, no matter how much we want to roll this out across the country, are we there yet broadband wise and, and whatever else infrastructure we might need? I'll speak to broadband from a community development, development perspective. It frustrates me no end, the conversations around rural Ireland and broadband. I got up and I was pitching Go Remote and afterwards a guy came up and he was like, but you're, how can you work remotely? You don't have the internet down there. Mm. We do, we do. And it's preventing so much. The challenge is that, is that rural Ireland and particularly community people in across rural Ireland, we're well used to challenges like um, broadband is just another one of those. I know we were invited to the broadband task force and I sent a guy asked uh, Ken Tobin in, from Tralee to go because when he was building his space in Listowel, he built a mast uh, to have the proper connection in there. Like he just solved it and he has a lot of opinions around it. I was working for Mara Moore for four days uh, a couple of weeks ago. The work that Three and Modam and the community are doing up there is fantastic. Broadband is a problem in some areas. Uh, it is, it's, it can't prevent us from working. In areas where there is broadband, we still need to layer on top, the jobs on top of that again. We have 300 digital uh, hubs or co-working spaces across the country that are generally community spaces that are not for profit and need to run. And what they do is they bring people into the town, they, they bring in back in that liveliness, that vibrancy, um, and they have people congregate who are working remotely. So. Is there an issue of broadband? Sure. Can we move ahead uh, where we are currently? Absolutely. And we need to. Like when you're working in community in rural Ireland, all you hear on the radio is, you know, the challenges that we have and that, you know, the government are on it and sure, the government don't really care about you anyway. And it gets really, really frustrating. And a pillar of community development is that you equip people with the tools and resources to make change locally. Um, and just sitting back and complaining about broadband won't get us there. Can I just add to that, Yvonne? I mean, ahead, just John, looking yeah. at it from a from a company perspective, uh, at Shopify, as I mentioned, we're spread across all 26 counties. We have people in, in, in every part of the country. And what we require is to work for us that you, you warrant that you have broadband and that you're able to communicate via phone, chat, and email with us and with, with, with our, our merchants, our customers. Um, we also require that people have a plan B and a plan C. The challenge right now is that plan B for a lot of people is, as Tracy referred to, co-working spaces, in, and a lot of them are community-based co-working spaces or coffee shops, mm. both of which are, are essentially off limits right now. So the challenge for us is to make sure that our every one of our team has a plan B whether it be a friend's house um, or whether it be a, an, alternate, an alternate service. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've had li little or no uh, impact on our connectivity over the course of the last two weeks of essentially forced isolation for everybody else. And the one very minor challenge right now, and I, 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 um, I want to make sure that we're aware of this, is that uh, there are so many people on... Um, online right now that there is a, a very small degradation of service but that's a worldwide issue that is not a rural ireland issue mm -hmm. and i hope to god people don't conflate the two mm -hmm. um i spent a whole week the first week of of um of this uh let's call it this this pandemic isolation i spent the whole week working about a mile and a half from mizzen head which is about as remote as you can get in ireland and i was using just a simple uh dongle a 4G dongle, and I was able to connect on um, conference calls to anywhere in the world. No issue. And I was, um, I just had absolutely no issue. I've never had an issue using a proper 4G dongle. So I, you know, we, um, we are not seeing this as a major issue. And in fact, if you look at the last week and go look at the press in the last week, the number of conversations regarding uh, broadband access is almost zero because when somebody is in a situation where they're forced to work for, to work from home guess what they're self-solving yeah i want to ask you in particular john about um your your company's policy of i think you call it following the sun is that right um so basically navigating across time zones i wanted to ask you about if if sure. 
you know, if John in Dublin uh, needs to get on a call with, uh, well, personally, I find New Zealand to be the most difficult country in the world to schedule a time to have a call with. There's just never a good time. Someone ends up talking at midnight or one in the morning. But um, how to navigate that and also staying with time. Um, I think we're going to see the nine to five model shift considerably uh, if we're all working from home. Um, how might someone identify or lean into what's the best and most productive time of the day for them? Sure, I, I think the, the the follow the sun concept is a little bit over um, overused. So what we uh, how we adopt it here, how we adapt to that is in Ireland we have uh, our folks work in what I would call uh, normal, relatively normal hours. Um, seven to we've folks who, who work seven to three. We've folks who work eight to four. We've other folks who work ten to six. We've a lot of leadership positions where we're kind of spread out over many of those mm -hmm. um, and what how we use this the, the follow the sun concept is as a group of people and, and let's break the world into sort of three or four discrete chunks we have a group of people in in canada and let's call it north america we have a group of people in ireland for europe we have a group of people in new zealand for the asia pac region and we also have um, support in the philippines from a partner and what we try to do is make sure that we have a large group of people available at all times. So when one of our merchants calls, there's somebody available. So the challenge, as, as you quite correctly uh, laid out, we have teams in New Zealand and to connect with our teams in New Zealand, we in Ireland overlap really probably, and it's not really a good overlap, probably an hour to, an hour or two mm -hmm. a day. So it is a challenge and that's where communication comes into it. So amongst the tools, we a lot of us will use uh, tools like like um, Zoom and Skype and a whole variety of other uh, Google Hangouts for video conference. That's not really helpful when you're talking to an Australian, New Zealand or whatever. Mm. Um, so you need other tools like Slack or Microsoft Teams. And that's where the another management muscle needs to be exercised, which is the ability to communicate in an asynchronous world. For me to be able to share my thoughts in writing on a tool like Slack, knowing that my colleague Rachel in uh, New Zealand will see that six or seven hours later, will comment on it, and then I will pick it up again. And that is one of the big challenges uh, that some companies at the very early days of going remote, that's where, the, where they struggle a little bit. So mm. the written communication has got to be viewed in line with the, um, the simultaneous contemporaneous uh, conversations um, via video conference. And Tracy, what um, John mentioned there, you know, people struggling with that at the start. What other kind of teething problems do people encounter when they first start working from home, especially in a situation like the, the situation we're in now where uh, it's been forced upon people rather than them choosing it? So, again, I suppose we're only really finding out the kind of problems that they're, we're dealing with when you're forced to work from home in a pandemic now. And I think it is, you know... I, childcare, you know, not having that space at home, a dedicated room where you can close the door and it's not distracted. Co-founder of mine was using the story of somebody who, with her child, developed um, something for the door where she could turn it uh, red or green if she was having a meeting so they couldn't get access. And there are all of these things that our people are, are doing now to try and adapt um, to this new way of working. John just mentioned in passing there, asynchronous communication. And I think it's that kind of language of remote that hasn't yet gone into the more traditional companies that ha are now going remote. So that way of working where you would have just went up to the desk and said, Mary, what do you think about this? And communicated that way. And now all of a sudden you have to think it through, write it down, send it in, wait for a response that's completely different. And initially it might seem less productive or slower. So it's, it's getting more traditional companies familiar with the type of language that uh, John is using. Um, and we use um, kind of things like remote work dictionaries or glossaries for, for the language of remote work to help educate people around that. Um, and then, sorry, John, you mentioned something else now there that I was trying to trying to, to reference with regard. Oh, sorry, the other problem that companies have, <clears throat> we've realised, is that they're asking us what Zoom is, what Microsoft Team is, what Slack is. And like that was really shocking for us. Um, but it's very basic technology pieces and seeing a comparison between what do each of these things do because the world of remote work is, a, is noisy before this, but now it's kind of a little bit of hype, a little bit of noise, and it's really hard to navigate through to understand what it is that's really useful for your particular use case in your company. 
And uh, we're almost out of time, so so thank you both uh, for your time. But I just want to ask you finally before we go, one one top tip if you want to leave us with one piece of advice. Okay, for me, uh, so you mentioned, I'm giving you time to think now, John, but um, so you mentioned about, you know, Web Summit and being open to working from home. For me, for our community's perspective, what I would love is if um, companies now, if remote does work for them and will help you on the journey if you're finding it challenging, that then they start to advertise those jobs locationless. That will help totally transform uh, how our local communities work and particularly now support the hardest hit communities that have lost jobs in the tourism and hospitality sector Go remote makes remote work visible and, and, and accessible locally and advertising those jobs without a location is good for the company, but it's really, really, really meaningful and impactful for our local communities. So it's not a tip, maybe more of an ask, but uh, I couldn't um, miss the opportunity to, to put in that ask because it no, is transformational for how we work. You, John? Uh, connection. It really boils down to connection, and the connection does not have, have to be a work-related connection. Multiple connect points during the day. Hey, Tracy, how, how are things going? Just that, that's a simple thing. Just I'm aware that you exist. You tell me everything's fine, and we connect on a continual basis during the day, whether it be on video conference or on uh, Slack or Teams or whatever tool that we're using. It's just that realization that we're both there. That's crucially important on a consistent basis. It's not me checking up to see what work has been done and hassling somebody. It's just basically a recognition that um, this is a, a, I'm essentially waving at you. It's almost like passing by somebody's desk in an office and a wink and a nod, how are you doing? Very, very important in the remote world. Don't forget people. I said that was the last question, but uh, I tell a lie, I actually want to squeeze one more quick one in for you, John. As someone who is full time permanently working from home, describe your home office to us. People might I, get I tips a, from it. OK, as you, you've probably noticed, I'm standing. Uh, so I have a standing, I have a, a very simple standing desk. Um, I have a monitor and a laptop, a mouse, a trackpad. I have reasonably good lighting. I paid, uh, where is it over here, uh, there. I paid uh, about 30 or 40 uh, euro to get a decal for my wall because I just like to be able to recognize that this is where I work. And it's almost like kind of, it's how I pimp out my office for want of a better description. I also have a mat, a standing mat, which a lot of chefs would be uh, aware of an anti-fatigue mat mm. that I use to, to stand on. And it's great because it helps you move around and keep moving. Um, what else do I have? I have a, um, I actually have in my office and it, it's, I've only used it once in three years. There's actually a landline. And the only time it's ever oh, been it's used is, it's, it's, I think the Smithsonian Institute called and looked for their exhibit <laughs> back. I think the only time I've ever used it is when my mother called me during a conference call. But I still have it almost as a, um, as a, a relic. But there's, there's two other things that I have which I think are important. And it's, this is probably more for the experienced remote worker. But uh, I have the um, Amazon Alexa tool. Um, I have a device in, in, my, in my home office. And I have it connected to uh, a ring doorbell um, downstairs so that if the phone, if, if the doorbell rings, the um, Alexa device lets me know that there's somebody at the door and I can actually answer it from here, which means I don't have to go downstairs. I know that's a bit geeky, but it's a very simple tool to have and it means that I'm fully productive. Right. Well, there's, I think there's a lot of good tips people can get from that. Um, John and Tracy, thank you both so much for joining us and uh, stay safe and well and self-isolated uh, until we speak again. Your groceries delivered to your door within the hour by a personal shopper. Sound good? Well, buy me. That's the name of Devin Hughes' new company and it's partnered with the likes of Lidl and Unilever. He's here to tell us all about it. Devin Hughes, founder of Buy Me. Thanks so much for joining us live from your house in Sandyford. How is self-isolation going for you? <laughs> Thanks, Yvonne. Um, yeah, I have to say, a bit of a bit of a surreal experience, if I'm honest. Um, you know, you see people out walking about, but it's uh, it's certainly not business as usual. Will you be having groceries delivered, hand delivered to your door? Always. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Devin, tell us about Buy Me. So what does it do? Um, Buy Me, we started back in uh, 2016. Um, it is a grocery e-commerce platform. And what we do is we allow users to order grocery and household items from large retail partners like Tesco and Little. 
and have their items delivered store to door uh, in as little as an hour by their very own personal shopper. When you put it like that, it seems like one of those ideas that you can't believe no one has had until 2016. Tell me about how you found that gap in the market and I suppose how you felt. Were you, were you surprised when you found it? Because I would personally be surprised that that, that didn't already exist. Yeah, and I suppose it's online grocery has been around for you know for nearly nearly two decades. Um, but you know, I first kind of stumbled upon the market in, in 2014, uh, which is when I actually started to work on the concept. And the big thing that I when I looked at the market, the thing that stuck out to me the most that there was an opportunity was that it was a nine billion pound market um, across Ireland, UK, which is you know absolutely enormous. But it was losing on on average 300 million pounds a year uh, in aggregate. And this was a loss that was subsidized by a collective of, of large grocery retailers uh, across both, both Ireland and the UK. Um, and when I, you know, my background is, is energy. I worked in the commodity markets, mainly in, in electricity distribution and management. And, you know, when I looked at the distribution model that, that was being used by grocery retail to, to move, you know, this large commodity around the market, it just didn't make sense at all in the sense that we had nine separate distribution networks all trying to do the same thing. Um, now, the only way to distribute commodity around a market is to use a shared infrastructure. We have one gas network, we have one electricity network, um, and we all contribute to the cost of that. So um, our concept really kind of came about from you know the concept of developing a shared infrastructure, uh, one digital platform and, and technology um, stack that would facilitate the same technology capabilities and logistics for all retailers within the market while connecting uh, customers with, uh, with personal shoppers in their local communities. And despite that, you still didn't get the warmest reception from some supermarkets when you started out. No. Um, so, so five weeks. So I, I, I left the energy markets in 20, uh, early 2015. I worked in a large tech, technology company called Salesforce for a year while I was kind of developing the concept and, and getting, a, getting an understanding of the market. And you know, I quit my job in February 2016 and became our very first grocery delivery person. Um, and five weeks after quitting my job, um, I was uh, invited into one of the largest retailers in the country uh, for a chat. Um, and after about an hour of asking me every question under the sun about the business, uh, I was actually told that the reason I'd been invited in was that um, they, their legal team was very upset that I'd been using their logo without their permission and I was going to get a cease and desist letter uh, the, the next day. Um, so I ended up finding myself for the first year of Buy Me, um, not only you know, running around Dublin like a headless chicken trying to deliver groceries, but also found myself in quite a public uh, legal uh, spat with one of the largest corporations in the country. Um, and that was, uh, that was quite an experience. And what, looking back on that, what is your perception of that now? Was it a case of, I mean, in, in one sense, it's almost flattering that early into your, the development of your company that you were seen as such a very real threat. But in another sense, do you think you were seen as a threat or it was just a case of, you know, you were more hassle and inconvenient and, and why not squash this bug before it gets off the ground, so to speak? Like, how do you interpret that now? It was, a, it was the sense of a threat to a certain extent. And, and to be honest, I actually, we were just a year early. Um, and that was really the problem. We were just a little bit too early. We recognized a couple of key trends that were happening in the market. And, and you, know, they're just, they're, you know, the market just wasn't, wasn't quite there yet. Um, and I think you know, what happened was in that scenario, and it's not down to any of the individuals, it's more down to just the natural um, behavior of large corporates uh, within the market, which is if we don't understand it, if we can't control it, and if we don't have a stakeholder internally that can manage it, um, let's just, it's kind of shoot first, ask questions later, let's mm -hmm. kill it and move on. Um, and we'll still be a, 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 you know, a, billion, a billion euro business. So I actually think it's, it was more just natural behavior patterns. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't anticipate that we would be perceived as a disruptor. We always set out to be an ally of the, of the grocery retail market. Um, and I think it was just more of a natural, a natural disruptive um, you know, market, market timing more so than anything else. Um, but you know, within a year, um, Amazon bought Whole Foods. Um, in the US and that sent a, a shockwave globally uh, to the grocery sector um, and all of a sudden we found ourselves kind of front and center for, for a very large wave um, that we were, we were kind of sitting on a surfboard for. And I suppose it's all kind of fallen into line for you since certainly in terms of the backing and the support that you've received. So you've got names on board like uh, Unilever, Lidl, you've got Eamon Quinn of Super Quinn on your board. So quite the turnaround for you from that initial uh, being sued, I suppose, to, to where you are now. 
for sure. I mean, it was it was. I would say it was the hardest part about that whole issue was that back in 2016, I was I was going around in between grocery orders. I was going around trying to tell investors that retailers are going to love this one day, mm. um, and that's a bit of a hard sell uh, when you know. Well, there's a public spot. <laughs> I'm just trying to kill you. Um, and, and at that time, you know, investors just really wouldn't touch us with a barge pole um, because they just couldn't see it at, at the time. Um, you know, as the market started to mature, you know, uh, and, and our, 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 our disagreement, I would say, with, with that in particular retailer um, kind of caught the attention of other stakeholders in the market, one of which was Unilever. Mm. Um, and, and, and when Unilever joined us, they actually acquired a stake in the business in 2017. Um, that sent a, a flare up to the market and um, to, to the, the private investor market that actually what we were doing was adding value uh, and what, at least one large corporate stakeholder recognized that at the time. And so that kind of helped us progress the business. It helped us get a little bit more capital into the business, although we were operating at a very low base at that stage. Um, that allowed us to keep going with the, with the efforts. And then when Amazon bought Whole Foods, um, that really kind of set the, set the trajectory for the market. And I think that made it very clear that we were working on a, a very interesting space. Um, Eamon Quinn joined us as, as our chairman. He'd been a mentor to me from, from, from the, the first couple of months when I started the business. I met him at a conference. Uh, we brought in Scott Weavers Wright, who's the ex CEO for Morrisons.com. Uh, and amongst the three of us, we started to pull together a large investor network that came in and supported us and, and helped us get to the next stage. Um, and then in, in 2018, um, we, we signed our first flagship partnership with, with Lidl, who's the largest grocer in Europe. Um, and so they have a very international view and, and they knew a lot of the challenges that we were solving. And since then, you've gone on to see the business increase. I think twentyfold. You were saying. Yeah. So, um, so we, so the ridiculous number is that we grew our weekly GMV, our weekly uh, revenue and sales uh, last year by roughly two thousand um, nice. percent. Aggregate, we we grew the business probably thirteen times uh, in that period. And from the start of this year, um, we've we've nearly doubled the business again uh, just in the first quarter. And do you think uh, it's obviously a reflection of the demand for it in the market, but in terms of the average Irish consumer, um, are we there yet in terms of mindset? Are we where you and your business would like us to be? Uh, and if so, you know, what are the key demographics that are the most plugged in to what you have to offer, I suppose? Sure. So Ireland actually is really uniquely positioned. So a lot of the tech companies, um, not only do they have their headquarters here, but they also test a lot of their newer products in, in the Irish market because Irish consumers uh, are quite native when it comes to digital technology and we're, we're fast adopters. Um, and so that has been a real natural benefit of us. We, we very quickly found early adopters for our technology back in 2016 um, and consumers very quick to adapt. The other benefits is, is that the likes of Deliveroo and Just Eat and Amazon Prime have all educated consumers around um, you know, the, the digital economy and, 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 and on-demand services. So I think that's, been, that's all, of these, all of these components, all of these externalities have been a big, a big component of our success. Um, when it comes to demographics, you know, we, we, we index quite strongly with, with females, um, both between the ages of 25 and 34 and 34 and 45. Um, so they would be they would be kind of, that would be kind of a, a large demographic that we would show to see showing through um, in our numbers. And I think in terms of you know the market as a whole, there's only three growth channels in the grocery FMCG sector uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, number one is online. Number two is discount. And number three is convenience. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we when we built this platform, we built the buying platform to straddle those three channels. And um, so we bridge the gap between convenience and online by providing, you know, same day delivery in as little as one hour in some cases. Um, but we also uh, were the first independent uh, platform to bring the discount channel uh, officially online in 2018. Um, and so th those, those three channels combined into one is quite a powerful uh, combination. And tell me about the role AI has played in the, the innovation, I suppose, that you're employing at the moment, because I know it's been quite crucial for you. It's it's to be honest, it's the, like most people think that we're a delivery company, but in actual fact, we're a data science company. And um, you know, all we do is we sit above the retail market and we manage the data and the cash flow between stakeholders, both personal shoppers, customers, and retailers. Um, and what's really interesting is that when we went to the market in 2016, we were looking for a routing algorithm and engine that would allow us to uh, process order data in real time and then distribute that across the market. In real time, and that's that's a really really complex challenge. And what we found was that a lot of people had built algorithms that would be able to do point you know a couch from point A to point B with a scheduled delivery time, 
um, but nobody was really using dynamic fulfillment um, uh, algorithms. And that was something that we, we kind of noticed that for grocery specifically, it absolutely needs to be real time because you're dealing with complexities like chill chain management, uh, chill and frozen food are a big part of our, our, our average basket. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that you're you're building that into your, into your, uh, your rooting optimization is so important. So, you know, in 2016, we started working on Jarvis and um, we're massive Marvel nerds in the office. Um, and Jarvis is essentially our AI. Um, it stands for just a, another rather very intelligent system for anyone who's not an Ironman fan. Um, and what Jarvis does is Jarvis collects all of the local grocery retail consumer data uh, in a market. Um, and it is constantly looking at all the real-time variables. So how many customers on the platform, how many items in their basket, uh, what delivery slots are they looking for, how many shoppers are in the network that could fulfill these orders. Um, and, and traffic conditions, picking conditions, on-shelf availability, just all of the real-time moving pieces. Um, and Jarvis will put all of those pieces together to make sure that the, those orders are sent to the very best personal shoppers to fulfill those uh, that customer's request within the specific time frame. Okay, yeah. So so it's pretty important then to your business. Um, sounds like the backbone of it. Um, in terms of the demand for Buy Me, personally, I hate strolling around supermarkets and uh, I know you'd mentioned previously that people spend I think you said 20% of their annual leave five days a year strolling around supermarkets which to me is just the worst thing ever no interest um, but then some people like the social aspect of going to the shop as well so how do you make uh, the how do you make buy me appealing to those people as well as the people who absolutely hate shopping yeah, so I think it's important that to to really bear in mind that you know I I'm not a I'm I don't I don't ascribe to the the school of thought that retail is going to disappear. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think the online channel is going to continue to grow and become more of a primary channel um, for the foreseeable future. And I think retail will start to take on a slightly different angle and, and social social being a big part of it. Um, you know I think customers aren't going to come to us all the time. Sometimes they will decide to go out. Um, you know, for example, you might choose to shop in you know a cer certain you know higher end retailers um, on occasion. You wouldn't shop there all the time, um, but when the mood strikes, you know that's something that you like to do, and it'll be more experiential. Um, I think from a consumer standpoint, you know, for us, I think online is going to become more of a backbone uh, of the market in terms of you know it, the general operations and and the core the core basket items that that customers need um, when they need them. I think that's a, that's a big part of it. You know, there's a big concept of of this you know uh, idea of pivot to passive which is where consumers are becoming more passive in the consumer experience you know 75 percent of all of the content that that we uh, that we view on netflix is 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 recommended you know we we very very we we engage very little in the in the broad library of content that sits on those platforms uh, and we rely on algorithms to, to passively surface that content to us and, and satisfy our needs and i think you know fmcg is is very much going the exact same way okay and you're no stranger to um, starting and then, I suppose, leaving a, a business when it's not working out for you, by which I mean, um, in your own words, not mine, in your own words, you've had four failed businesses so far. What made you want to jump back in a fifth time? I think a lot of people, if they'd been burned by that experience four times, wouldn't dream of going back in a fifth time. So what made you want to go back in? Why buy me? And do you think you've settled on a winner this time? So three questions and a question. one. Um, I suppose it's a, it's, a, it's a touch masochistic, if I'm honest. <laughs> um, mainly, like, you know, start, starting a business, and I usually do, yeah, my own words, four spectacular failures to get to this point. Um, you know, realistically, uh, I think the concept of starting a business has always been, you know, really exciting to me. The idea of building something new, the idea of changing people's lives and the way people live is something that I really, really um, get off on, uh, to be very honest. And and so, um, the, I think after the first four, I took a break of about two and a half years um, before buying me, and it was mainly just to, you know, recover, you know, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually <laughs> um, from the process because it, it can be extremely draining. Mm. Uh, you know, when I when I stumbled upon, you know, the grocery commerce sector, I I kind of fell in love with just how dysfunctional the market was. Um, and I could see very clearly from my own experience in the energy markets that there was there was a model here that could transform the way um, the online grocery market operated. And it is going to be one of the largest markets and it's going to touch everyone's lives. Um, in, into the future and that that concept just really excited me I felt like this was you know one of the last great frontiers um, for for technology and um, you know in the sense that 
the self-service supermarket model that we use today where everyone goes to a warehouse and, and buys their bread on that side of the warehouse, goes to get that side of the warehouse to get their milk. You know, that was founded in 1916. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that, that's when the self-service model started. And I think it's interesting now to look at, at how technology is starting to change that space and even given the current, current climate, the impact that that's having. Um, so, yeah, I just thought it would be a really fascinating place to spend a decade or two of my career. Very good. And um, in terms of, you know, the decade or two of your career, hopefully will be very well spent in that market. But right now, the times we live in, is the market absolutely hopping with everybody at home self-isolating with Corona? Has it had much of an effect at all or what's what's the view like on your side? Yeah, I mean, we've we've seen, as I said, we've been growing really fast for the last well, last four years that we've been in the market. But um, I mean, there's no doubt that the last quarter has been uh, unprecedented. And um, I think not just from a you know a society point of view, but from a commercial standpoint point of view, I think the entire landscape uh, of the business climate has been has been upended. Um, and and grocery is kind of front and center at the moment because I think the thing is that the world that we live in today, I think a lot of people take for granted the abundance uh, of of goods and services. Um, you know, and there's certain there's certain industries that underpin our societies and and what what it takes to have a functioning society and that and that's you know energy supply and 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 food supply um, and I think what what people have really recognized now that is in this period of you know significant uncertainty where we've never you know, no one alive today has experienced this um, this type of environment I think um, you know food food supply has become uh, just a, a you know front and center of everyone's mind. Um, so I, I think definitely we found ourselves in a very unique position, um, and we're you know we've a we've a, a strong team you know doing their absolute best to try and provide as much service and much capacity to the market as possible right now because you know not only is this our business but it, it just so happens to be the right thing to do at this point um, and it's it's quite an important service that we're we found ourselves providing. It, it kind of feels like you know the work that we did last year in terms of scaling and getting our systems in places has, has taken on a slightly higher meaning. Okay, well, that's where we'll leave it. Devon, thank you so much for joining us from Sandyford and uh, good luck with the rest of self-isolation and we'll see you on the other side along with the rest of the world. Well, that's it for this week's show. Thanks so much to John, Tracy and Devon for joining us remotely, of course. We'll be back next week when I'll presumably still be flying solo. But in the meantime, don't forget to hit subscribe to get the full show each week on podcast and YouTube so that you never miss an episode. (laughs) 